So today we are starting, to, we're going to start talking about chronic illness. Got questions here, lots of questions, which will probably get us through the 90 minutes that we're being going to be here, the 75 minutes now. And I'm going to take a step back because this topic of what chronic illness is, what it entails, what has to happen to heal it, is still very new information. And by that I mean we are in a space and place right now in our field of health and healing where we are just starting to learn about the consequences of stored traumatic stress in the body, how early traumas impact the development of the nervous system, not just the nervous system itself, but the development of the nervous system. And we're also starting to find the science is lining up with what the research has told us, specifically something called the ACE study. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then we also have the practices that are finally lining up. And if you can visualize this in your own mind's eye, I'm kind of seeing it like three lines that are all finally coming together, looking in the same direction. Before we had one of the lines, maybe another one, um, we didn't have the research, we didn't have the science, the practices were kind of off kilter. But if you're here watching this now, this is going to be a bold statement, but I'm going to say it anyway, you are in the right place because what I have studied, what my colleagues have studied, my team have studied, this is the work that helps heal these things. I say that things with air quotes, these illnesses, these, um, what we used to think were just psychosomatic illnesses, um, chronic mental illness, things that we have put towards in many of the old textbooks as disease, as abnormalities, as genetic defects. And while genetics definitely plays a part in the expression of disease, it does not mean that it will happen and that has to do with our environment and I think tell me if you guys have heard of this concept the concept of nature or nurture nurture nature now we know without any doubt that nature and nurture are both important nature meaning genetics our DNA our genetic predisposition and then nurture being how we have been treated as an organism from day one and how our environment treats us and how we take care of ourselves. And a lot of times we'll have, and there's a question here about um, family lineages all having say heart disease or cancer or autoimmune. And the reason why from what we know is there is a genetic component. There is a, um, a predisposition for certain parts of our systems to be more, we'll say, I don't like to use the term weak, but more susceptible. And that doesn't mean that that has to express. And we, found, we have found through epigenetics, which is the study of that expression, uh, genetics being turned on, that depending on the environment, we will either turn something on or keep it off. So that's my little preamble with um, we're really looking right now in the chronic illness world at it is more than the symptom. And often what we see and we what we deem as um, the illness is actually a symptom of an underlying root trouble, root problem, which is dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. Peter Levine, founder of Somatic Experiencing, someone who I've studied with quite a bit over the years, he calls this, and I'm reading so that I make sure I get this right, um, autonomic dysregulation syndrome and um, you know like we need another acronym but he calls it ADS he's written a paper on this it's not published yet but after all of his you know 40 years of being in the field and seeing people if I go back to those lines that I talked about we've got the science we have the research we have the practices he's in that boat where all these things are lining up and it's pretty clear that these symptoms, these syndromes are occurring because an individual had that early upbringing that wasn't safe, maybe lots of traumas to the physical body. It could have been through abuse, adversity. It could have been to mul through multiple surgeries as an infant. 
It can be due to um, environmental stress, so being brought up in a war-torn country, which does exist in our world. Um, and it can also be due to this intergenerational trauma that we know exists. So the science is there, the research is there, and then of course the practices. So um, with that said, I'm gonna take a step back. We have to look at the healing of chronic illness, not in the way that we've seen, say, in medicine, the healing of a staph infection or the, the healing of a broken bone. Say you fall over skiing and you have to get your bone um, replated and you have to do the rehab, right? There's usually a timeline for that. And while there might be repercussions of a little arthritis and all of that, the healing of chronic illness isn't so finite. And that is where we have to really look at sort of the whole picture in the system. So I'm gonna start by getting into the questions and then as I get into these questions, that will help inform um, the theory that I have to keep teaching you guys so that you understand where this is coming from. But the first thing I will say is in terms of this concept of autonomic dysregulation syndrome, we have to first understand that there are two branches to the autonomic nervous system. And then the autonomic nervous system is branched from the peripheral nervous system. So if you think about it and play with me here, this helps with the learning. Your central nervous system is your brain. So put your hands to your head and say, hello brain. And then trust me, it makes it better if you do that. So hello brain, brain and spinal cord, the cord that runs in your spine all the way down to your tailbone, that is the central nervous system. From that central nervous system, there are nerves that come out of the brain stem and out of the spinal cord. That is your peripheral nervous system. So it helps to do that, trust me. So peripheral nervous system comes out of the brain and spinal cord. That peripheral nervous system creates the autonomic nervous system. So if you want to sort of repeat, autonomic means automatic. We don't have conscious control directly of the autonomic nervous system. So prime example I always give, if you've been on these calls with me, if there's a loud bang outside of my house, you'll probably hear it, you'll probably orient to it, I'm gonna orient to it, or I'll flinch, right? That is my autonomic nervous system. The peripheral system is picking up an external threat. My sensory systems are alerting to that, and my body is gonna go, what, what was that? And you might even go, what was that? right? A seagull just flew over my head outside and my eyes, some of you might have been watching my eyes, it looked at that because I wanted to make sure nothing was crazy and unsafe. Clearly it wasn't, so now I'm back here with you guys. So our autonomic nervous system creates these autonomic, automatic, defensive responses to keep us safe. Fight, flight, and freeze. Someone asked me the other day, they got a little pissed because I didn't mention the fawn response in my healing trauma video series. I don't mention it because the fawn response is part of the shutdown and freeze response. It's what we go into, we submit when we realize we can't fight, we can't flee, we're shutting down. So a, for sort of a part of that freeze response is this fawn response. It's this it's like, okay, I'll submit, you're right, you win. But that is part of that. So that's why I don't distinguish the fawn response, but it is in there. Um, so that fight, flight, freeze, fawn, it is part of the autonomic nervous system response. That's number one. Number two, autonomic nervous system, it is also responsible for, take your hands, heart, organs, right? Hormones that come out of parts of our brain and our adrenals, our thyroid, our um, reproductive organs, right? For men, it's testosterone, women, estrogen, progesterone, spleen, liver, kidneys, all of it, all of our organs and our muscles, right? And the blood and the pressure, blood pressure, immune system, I'm, I'm picking these carefully because this all relates to chronic illnesses. Skin, all of these joints, right? Everything in our body is connected to via the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system's job is to keep flow going 
but but if there is a stuckness in those survival fight flight freeze responses it's going to throw the mechanics of our organ systems and the repair and the healing and the immune response and the hormonal response and the cardiovascular response and the respiratory breath response our ability to sleep at night turn off and be alert our heart rate to go up when we're going up a flight of stairs that fight flight freeze if it is if it is abnormally turned on and not off when we don't need it so if we are constantly thinking we are in a state of threat or if we're constantly in a state of shutdown and shock if we think that the world is a big bad dangerous place and we're on that alert or we're in shutdown that is going to impact all of these organ systems hormonal systems cardiovascular muscular immune endocrine even relational so that's the preamble that goes with chronic illness because when we think of chronic illness and we have this in these questions here the trouble is in these organ systems in the immune response okay so first question my mom this was from instagram um, my mom has an unidentified skin condition for the past five years that's making her hands itch like crazy and it's gradually moving up her arms. The allergist found nothing. The dermatologist um, can't figure it out and she's giving up any hope of getting better. I think it might be partially due to her shoving her emotion and her own needs down to make everyone else happy her entire life. Any suggestions on my front or on any front would be appreciated. So number one, um, you're gonna have to make sure that your mother is interested in healing this at this level. I know that might be a bit harsh, but I have found that we, the person who's living with the condition usually needs to be the one seeking out the help. Doesn't mean that you can't offer her and show her this stuff, but then she has to want to take it on. And I say that before I get into specifics because I've seen time and time again, um, usually sorry guys but it's usually true usually it's the women that start this healing work and then they try to get their guys on for the ride and often it's like you know trying to take a kid to the dentist they just don't want to do it and so there needs to be a willingness on that person's part um, because then us as the, the the daughter or the spouse or the care provider will go crazy trying to help the person that doesn't want help that is another part of our healing as individuals is we have to be okay with um, being okay with people that we love being in pain and, and suffering and know that that's not our journey to fix unless they truly want the help, but then they have to take ownership of it. So that's kind of my general blurb on that. Skin is an interesting one because um, I've actually myself suffered from massive skin problems. If you go to my site, uh, Crystal could pop that up on my about page. Um, you'll see three very gruesome pictures when I had what looked like third degree burns all over my body. And that's when it was good. It ended up covering my whole system. And I went to the allergist. I went to the dermatologist. I went to all these things. I changed my food. My specific thing was that I was exposed to massive amounts of chemicals as a child and in utero, and so was my mother. And then I was exposed to chemicals from birth till like my 20s, right? So I was brought up um, in an animal hospital. My parents were both vets, they had no idea. So, mom and dad, if you're listening to this, not your fault. Um, but they, you know, I was exposed and my hands were in things. I was breathing anesthesia, all these things, bleach, formaldehyde. And so what occurs when we have that kind of chemical exposure, and I'm saying this for you just in case your mother was someone who was exposed to harsh chemicals, it can create something called fluid trauma, also known as chemical trauma. You will not find this if you Google it because it's a very specified type of trauma healing work that I've learned through one of my mentors, Kathy Kane. She practices something called, and teaches something called somatic practice. So when you have that kind of exposure to chemicals, it can come out through the skin because your skin is an excretory organ, right? So excretory means it is an organ that is releasing waste products and toxicity that's inside 
The kidneys also do this too, but the skin is the biggest organ, so it exposes those chemicals. So I healed that through obviously emotional work, but also very specified um, fluid work. I won't get into that because it's too complex for this chat. Um, I did do some work, more energy work with a woman that does, um, it's called pendulum work, frequency work. It's also called body dowsing. So you can look that up, but it's, it's, it's where a person is getting, um, it's almost like a diagnosis of where things are off on the body, where things are blocked. And then the remedy and the way of healing that is very specific. Now that is not my expertise. It's something I've used personally. I'm going to put that out there just so that you have all your options. The other thing that I've seen with skin troubles and things that are mysterious like this, past lives. I know many of you might be like, what? But I have done some reading and I've had my own experience with this and with clients. Past life trauma, from what I've seen, is truly real. And of course, you have to believe in the soul and spirit to get what that means. If you want to read a really great book on that, um, Many Lives, Many Masters by Brian Weiss. I re just reread it last week. I read it for the first time in 2000, so it's been over 20 years since I read it. That talks about how really mysterious things can pop up in current day from past life. Again, I'm just giving you the full gamut. The next thing about the skin, you are correct. If there was no food allergies found, it's possible that it isn't a food allergy. Um, I know when I was struggling with my skin stuff, I could not have two things. One was fish sauce, one was red wine. To this day, I still react a little bit to fish sauce. Red wine, no problem. What it is about fish sauce, I have no idea, but I over trial and error had to listen to my body and my skin to know what it was that was problematic. To get to the next part of this question, emotions. You are correct. You said, I think it's due to her shoving down her emotions and her own needs to make everyone else happy in her entire life. This is 100% accurate. If you read the book, When the Body Says No by Gabor Maté, that is the thesis of that book. We have seen, he has seen that when people, usually it's women, but not always, but usually women are constantly doing for others, being self, selfless and helping, helping, helping at their own expense, usually under that is huge resentment and anger, even though they would never admit it. Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I, of course I'll do that for you. That, while human, and more what we would say evolved actually isn't because it's denying our animalistic needs for expression, for, for anger, for sadness, for grief. And the hands, right, are intimately connected to our communication up here in the brain. So again, I can't make any generals. This is more general, not specific. Emotions need to be moved. They need to be sent out and expressed. Typically, when there is a suppression of emotion, a disregard for emotion, a numbing to the emotion, and this is going to be true for a lot of these other questions, so I'll say it now. When we have that numbing of emotion and that block, it's hard to access the deeper old traumas that are sitting in our autonomic nervous system, specifically in what is called our procedural memory. So I'll give you an example. And this is totally general. But because a lot of females have lived through this, have survived this, and are keeping a lot of anger and rage stored inside because of such things, I'm going to use the example. So if a woman was sexually assaulted or raped, and they didn't fight because they couldn't, they froze and they shut down. But as that attack is happening, it could even be being spanked, being hit as a kid. So hopefully you guys get this, where we are being assaulted and we can't hit, we can't push, we can't scream, we can't scratch, we can't hiss, we can't strangle, right? Watch my Q&A on anger that was last week after this. So if we don't get those movements out, those procedures that are autonomic nervous system, so from what I said at the very beginning, if we don't get those movement actions out, 
that our brain wanted to do automatically, what do you think happens? They get stored inside. This is why we see when there's been a lot of abuse, physical, sexual, there will be a lot of tension in a person's body. And it isn't because they're overworking their muscles or have bad posture necessarily. It's because of that stored procedural motor muscular response is desperately trying to act out these movements and these procedures of, of protection and they can't. So that's one piece. But if we have got emotion on top of that, that we are not letting out because we want to make sure everything, everyone thinks we're fine and I'm fine and I have no problems and oh, I never get angry and God, I can't get sad because of my, you know, all those things. If we keep our emotions stuck. It is going to keep those procedural memories even more stuck because that emotion has to move so that it can make way for the massive procedural defensive autonomic response that in some ways in that instance is to kill right is to harm and protect so to come back to this question we started with skin it could be so many things and i think you might have hit the nail on the head here with this question about emotions being shoved down now, I'm going to answer this early because this is going to be the answer to a lot of other questions. Someone might be asking, well, then how do we get that anger out? How do we move it out? You can't just sit here and pretend to punch the abuser or the attacker or strangle them because me doing this right now isn't connecting to an emotion and a felt sense because I'm talking to you. I'm not in that. So part of the work, part of healing a chronic illness that has been popped due to stored traumatic stress means going back to the basics. There's no quick fix here. It's not like taking some antibiotics and then waiting for seven days and, and then all of a sudden the anger comes out. There needs to be the same apprenticeship as someone who um, has a mental illness, someone who has a relational um, traumas, early traumas where there is panic and fear, um, it all comes into the same boat or vessel. So we need to get education on board. I know you guys are here getting education with me today, but this is not enough. I say that quite sincerely. We need more education about how the inner workings of the nervous system occur. We need to work on basic practices. I call them the ABCs and one, two, threes of nervous system health and apprenticeship. So learning how to reconnect to our environment. I've done two really good videos on that. One is a long form Q and A. One is on the, um, uh, the, the two basics of orienting. So Crystal can post those there up or down on the comments here. Um, we need to relearn to connect to the environment. We re need to relearn to connect to ourselves, which takes time. Again, it isn't take one pill and you're good in seven days. It takes constant practice. And um, the video that I did last week that posted on my YouTube channel, everyone must listen to that one. It is an analogy for what it takes to rewire and regulate the nervous system. I use the example of learning a second language as an adult. So if we are living with chronic conditions of various types, we need to look at our healing as relearning how to regulate our nervous system. Or my metaphor is, it's like you're learning a second language as an adult. If you've ever done that, it takes more than seven days, 21 days, or 12 weeks. And I say 21 and 12 weeks because the programs I teach are those time frames, And it's the start. Part of the work is to continue to do the work and work with your own physiology. The other thing, um, the other thing that everyone can start doing right away is learning how to follow their biological impulses. So by that I mean when you feel the need to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. When you're tired, let yourself rest. When you want to speak something and say something to someone, say it. If you have to sneeze, just sneeze. Don't hold it in, right? Let gas out, let burps out. Let this biology, okay, so I'm going to come back to what I said 
half an hour ago and I was talking about how the autonomic nervous system, you guys remember how it connects to the, the viscera and the heart and all of this. When we deny those biological impulses of hunger, tired, passing gas, I mean, you get it. We are sort of slowly, softly telling our autonomic nervous system, you don't know what you're doing. Get that? It's like we're denying its natural organic need. This was taught to us so early in life, typically, that it's just second nature to excuse ourselves whenever we do something that's biologically needed by our body. So part of the healing, which you can all, all can start today, maybe you're sitting here watching this and you really need to go to the bathroom, go, come back, or bring your phone with you. Whatever it is, you've got to start listening to these impulses before the heavy lifting of getting anger out and getting emotions out because without those basic autonomic impulses there, that emotion is not going to come out in a pure state or it's going to be messy and we won't know, won't know what to do with it. All right, so that was a very long first question, but I hope you guys can see that there's these layers that all um, connect to these questions. So get, let me have a little sip. <clears throat> How's everyone doing? Um, Madeline, Madeline asks, is autonomic dysregulation the same as central sensitization? Mostly yes. So this comes back to chronic, I'm assuming you're meaning with chronic pain. Yes, there is something that is called um, a kindling response, this response of this ramping up where we become so sensitized I sh and really hypersensitized to stimulus in the external but also stimulus on the internal. And a lot of that is because we don't take the time to slow down what we are noticing. Often, and this is being very general, we'll see people who were in accidents, um, like car accident is one of the best descriptions, or um, they were exposed to some kind of violence in um, war or natural disaster, where things were just coming at them so much that they couldn't handle it, or an accident, and maybe there's a lot of pain, like real physical acute pain, like there was a burn, or there was a broken bone or an injury. And this is where medicine actually can be really important, where we do need to do something to calm ourselves down. Maybe we do need to take a painkiller. You know, again, we have to be careful with what we take and how it's monitored, but we want to discharge, not discharge, that's not the right word. We want to um, disarm like a bomb. We want to disarm it so that it's not continually firing the pain response, but then we have to do the work to learn how to listen to the kind of vibrations of the pain that come out in little bits afterwards. If we don't work at helping to disarm those strong pain responses from the acute shock or trauma, they can ramp up. And that's what we see with people who do have accidents where they're put on medications, but then they never get out of that loop and then they become reliant on that, usually opioid, to bring the pain down. We need to start to tease out that medical help so that the person can take charge of their own physiology. Um, and that is a work in progress to learn how to do that. Okay, next question. Um, any goodies for rheumatoid arthritis? My mom and sister suffer with it. So this comes back to, remember what I said at the beginning about genetics and predisposition? Um, that is something to understand. So possibly within this family system, the genetic um, DNA, there is uh, the, the genes for inflammation for autoimmune are just more a bit more heightened. But rheumatoid arthritis falls into the same category as this chronic inflammation, pain, the system is in dysregulation. So again, dysregulation meaning that fight, flight, and freeze. Usually when there's dysregulation, not usually, 
mostly always. There is a high cycling, if I'm doing this with my hand, of fight flight, but then there's this clamp of freeze on top of it that's trying to like say, go away, go away, we don't want to feel you, we don't know what to, we don't know what to do with you. And then the shutdown response is trying to, to keep it down. And what, what happens, this is a very simple explanation for how um, a chronic illness, a chronic syndrome comes up, is the system is trying to make sense of both fight, flight, and freeze being on at the same time, and it can't handle it anymore. And so what it does is it, it literally will pop a symptom in the body that can then create a syndrome. There's a video I did well over four years ago. It's quite old, um, but it's still good. It talks about, I actually draw out the graphs of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, both being on at the same time. And we don't want that. We want the sympathetic but then the parasympathetic that slows us down to come in so that it can bring the fight flight down. But if the fight flight is staying and it ain't going nowhere because of our culture and our conditioning and not knowing what to do with that high level of arousal, that autonomic, again, automatic nervous system will come in and pop on that little freeze response to say no mas, but it actually is not calming it down. It's just trapping it's like trapping the gerbil in the cage and it's running, 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 and then putting that in frozen water, right? That's not good. So to us, to me, to this work, rheumatoid arthritis falls into the same category as fibromyalgia, as gut troubles, as um, chronic pain syndrome. Now, of course, there can be things that a person can do to externally help soothe that area. Um, I've been reading more about the works of Edgar Cayce. Um, look him up. He's long past, but um, I'm in interested in, in external things that can be used for arthritis because I do have not, I don't have rheumatoid. It's different from osteoarthritis. Um, but he has talked about the use of, this is going to sound odd, but peanut oil. Peanut oil as as, a, as a, a lotion to put on rheumatoid arthritis. So I've just been trying it for osteo, and I don't know if it's a placebo effect, but it seems to help. So I'll give you that. Um, I'm always studying side things like that. So look that up. Um, next question, I have chronic fatigue syndrome and early trauma. Um, some days I feel quite well and energetic, only to crash the next day. This can make it hard to manage day-to-day -day life as I often overestimate, estimate, overestimate how much my body is capable of. What causes this delayed reaction and how can we learn, how can I learn to work with my body and not against it? So this is a very classic um, thing that occurs with folks that have chronic fatigue. So the first thing to understand is that we know through the research, especially the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, that when we have had early trauma, especially pre-verbal trauma, this is before we could talk and make cognition out of the world, even form solid memories of time and space. When we are exposed to threat, stress, and again, it doesn't have to be abuse, it could be, um, being born prematurely and having to be yanked out of mom, being put in an incubator, not having that connection and touch that a baby needs to learn self-regulation. It could be due to um, lots of surgeries. When we were infants, a lot of babies have to go into surgeries to fix conditions um, that, you know, in the past is going to sound harsh, we wouldn't have survived, right? So we've got this medical system that is allowing life to continue. And then what's occurring is this system is fragile, right? It is living in a state of stress, fight, flight, and freeze. And what the ACE study has shown, while it is more around abuse and neglect and mental illness, it's of the same Mm, it's of the same milieu as if we were put into an incubator, if we had early birth trauma, medical trauma, et cetera. 
So what occurs when we have this, um, the best way to say it is inaccurate, inaccurate capacity to, to feel our own capacity. So we are almost unsure, we're blind in a way of what is safe, how far we can push, and usually that's there, I'm speaking generally, but usually that's there because we do not have a connection to our own physiology because early on we had to disconnect from our physiology to stay safe, to stay safe. So I'm going to say that again. When we had this early type of insult to the body, the way that the baby survives is they disconnect from what they're feeling because if they're feeling it and feeling it, it actually can put them into so much hyperarousal um, and then shut down that the system often won't survive. And so as preservation, we disconnect from the somatic system. And so when we are more adult and we're doing things, that language, I go back to this whole idea of having regulation, being like having fluent language in your mother tongue, we need to reteach how to listen to the physiology. This is why I said a few seconds ago or a few minutes ago, one of the first steps to healing anything that is related to untreated early trauma is listening to the biological impulses, right? We need to start at that basic remedial level so that we can start to reattach and reconnect to what is in our system. And so if we can listen to that better, there will be something in our body that says, it's like it knocks on our door and it says, don't, don't do that next thing. Like, and it, it's like a little, it's like a little thing that goes off. And if you get really good at listening, it's often not a thought, it's a sensation. It might be a sense of dread. It might be a sense of your body literally internally saying to you, stop, pause, collect yourself. So this goes hand in hand, those that have chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and pushing too far. The other reason why is, again, in just working with people and hearing these stories, typically when we had this kind of early trauma, and it was at the hands of our immediate caregivers and family system, and not because they were trying to abuse us you know, physically, they just didn't know. Right, but what we learn as a little somatic preverbal system is I can't count on anyone and I have to take care of it all myself and I can't ask for help because you know what, no one's home. And so literally or metaphorically, and so it's all on me and I just have to go, 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 go. And then what occurs is that go, go, go gets to a point where the body says, screw you, you gotta stop. And then that's where it pops a syndrome or a chronic illness. So we have to learn to listen. The idea of this delayed reaction, it's possible that that delayed reaction is delayed because it's take, it takes your body a little bit of time and your mind to catch up to the fact that, all the, that you've got constriction in your diaphragm, that your gut has been clenched for five hours that day, but you didn't even notice it because you weren't connected to that. So part of this retraining and relearning is learning how to like physically reconnect to these, to this first brain of ours, which is our gut. Um, I mean, think about it. When kids are at school and they are stressed, they don't say, oh my God, mom, I'm so stressed. As a five-year-old, I have a tummy ache. You know, like they, they, they say physical, visceral things that give us the clue that they don't feel safe, that something isn't right. And so as big people, we got to listen to those tummy aches and those squeezings and all of that. So we can definitely heal this. You just have to relearn to listen. Um, how important, next question, how important is it, how important is it to not be your diagnosis? Great question. I have a positive Lyme result and have had pretty severe neurological symptoms, but I don't want to give in into the idea that it's chronic, as I know my symptoms have been a long time coming. So I agree with this in that we want to flip the language, and this is something I learned really early on in my days of um, training in Feldenkrais, was to rather say, 
I have to, rather to say I I live with this condition. I live with this defect. I live with this paralysis, um, as opposed to I have it. I am it. I own it. And because of our higher brain, and I mentioned this earlier in the call, we can create that reality and imprint it even more when we say, this is mine, I have it, right? We actually want to be like, I live with this, but it's not me. Of course, if we have something that does limit our capacity to be in the world and have the same level of rigor and vitality as, say, someone that, say, doesn't have Lyme, um, then we have to be smart. We can't be stupid. We can't push to the point of trying to be like the next person. We have to know what our limits are. We have to respect them. We have to nurture ourselves and basically practice um, self-care around that. Then there are things where there is a real medical diagnosis. So again, I still like to say to people, rather than saying, this is me, I live with it. If we think about something like a type 1 diabetes, or really any diabetes, we don't want to mess with that, right? We don't want to mess with that fine level of insulin and glucagon control in our physiology because it can put us into a coma and it can kill us, right? It can make it so that circulation isn't going to our feet um, and all our other organs. So I've met people who have been um, so reckless with their conditions to the point where they they make it worse because they're not taking care of them themselves. So when we think of chronic illness and maybe something like Lyme, you got to get the facts straight. I do believe in medical help, having a good physician, having a good protocol, taking care of yourself. The more we can reg, but and I will say, the more we can regulate our nervous system, even with a condition it makes it so that that condition or that disease or that virus is less powerful, right? Is less potent. And everything is, is different. Everyone is different in how they treat um, these conditions, these diseases, these viruses, et cetera. Um, one, of our, one of my alumni, Lisa Dennis, wrote a book called Unveiling Lyme. Crystal, if you can pop that up, it's on Amazon. Um, and she has gone through my programs. She is also trained in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. And she has really shifted her physiology by doing this nervous system work and recognizing that, yep, that's what I have and that's what I got, but it isn't me, right? So very important to know these distinctions and to take care of yourselves. EMDR is not something that I recommend off the bat, mainly because if we have got some form of early trauma and we aren't able to be attuned to our physiology, I have found that it can push a person into overriding their sensations because it's so high level and it involves very strong stimulus to the senses, specifically the eyes. So um, EMDR, tray, EFT, the tapping is a little more gentler, but it's all about titration and doing this work slowly and not pushing it. Now, somatic experiencing work alone, from my experience, is not enough, especially when there has been early trauma and especially when there is chronic illness. This is why in my work, in my programs, I am combining not just my expertise in SE, but also the work in um, what I've learned through Kathy Kane, which is working with the stress organs, working at that deep regulation state. And I also bring in movement through my Feldenkrais work because that's um, connecting to, if you remember from the very beginning of this call, I talked about the peripheral nervous system, remember that? We also have to work with the motor nervous system so that's the muscles, the movements, because that can indirectly impact the autonomic nervous system and the central nervous system. SE was primarily developed at the beginning to work with shock trauma, accidents, falls, um, things that occur to us when we are adult. Peter Levine has every ability and skill to work with early trauma, um, but it isn't it isn't displayed properly in the training, and so it gets missed. And that's why many of my colleagues, we go on, the ones who really want this to be our profession, 
They go on to work and learn from experts who work with early trauma and work with early regulation and who work with um, pre-verbal trauma. Can you, can you share a few suggestions on how to best handle IBS, endometriosis, and diabetes? So I'm gonna read this out. I'm not going to go through everything I just talked about because irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's, um, chronic diarrhea, chronic constipation, um, leaky gut. So our gut, right here, say hello to your gut, it is governed by the autonomic nervous system, right? When I take a sip of water, which I will, I don't have to think about how the muscles and how my esophagus pumps that water into my stomach. I don't think, okay, now I have to release the gastric juices. Now I have to open up the duodenum. Now I have to, you get where I'm going? So that is all automatic. If we have this fight, flight, freeze that is running the front of our show and it is on 24 seven, that is going to directly impact the signals that go to all of our viscera and all of our organ systems, it will impact it and the system is going to be in this state of dysregulation. It's gonna be rather than this nice, so if you're watching my hands, we want flow, we want these valves to be opening and closing in synchrony, synchrony. It's like a, it's like, um, a symphony. If you go to the symphony, and you know, you're listening to the orchestra, you've got the conductor. The conductor is like that higher level system saying, okay, you and you and then everyone, and they're all playing in harmony, right? At the beginning, if you've ever been to the symphony, they're, they're practicing, they're playing, it's just this chaos, it's like a cacophony and nothing makes sense. Having the system be, having the system in this fight, flight, freeze, this dysregulated state is like that beginning of the symphony. So part of these conditions like IBS, like chronic pain, where there's this tension, it's because of this lack of flow. The other thing with IBS, when we're living in that state of survival, there's a portion of our nervous system. If Have you heard of the term rest digest? So if you have, give me a little like, right? So rest, digest, that is part of our nervous system that allows us to repair, recoup, and regenerate. That's what we want to be in when we're asleep at night. When we're in that rest, digest, we're in a very specific portion of our parasympathetic nervous system. It's called the low tone dorsal of the parasympathetic. Not many people talk about that, but that is what is occurring. When we're in that low tone state, I liken it to being like in neutral of a shift of a, a stick shift car. It's really resting. It's idling slowly. There's no wear and tear going on to the system. When we're in that true rest digest, the immune system gets enhanced. The cells of the gut lining get stitched back up. It's called gut repair, gut barrier keeping and our general cellular structure, it gets repaired, it gets enhanced, it gets rejuvenated. So when we have that low tone dorsal, we have recovery. If we are living in a state of chronic stress and survival, it's very hard for the system to go into that neutral gear and to be in that low tone. We actually go to sleep and maybe we sleep, but we are in a state of what's called high tone dorsal, technically high tone dorsal shut down. And we are so shut down that that, I'm thinking like little men and women and elves in our bodies going in to re repair things. It's like they've been shut away and they can't get through the, the, the door. And so we go to sleep and we literally go to sleep and we pass out so much that we don't do any rejuvenating processes. This over time is how the gut becomes destroyed. The leaky gut is because that barrier keeping isn't happening, so things leak, things get inflamed. I know personally when I don't sleep well, um, for whatever reason, I wake up and I feel a little more poofy, I feel a little bit more red, a bit more inflamed, and that's because there wasn't that 
deep, deep restorative sleep that repairs things. So to go back to the question, how do we handle IBS, endometriosis, um, diabetes, again, that comes back to this low tone dorsal. If the system isn't getting its, its ample rest and rejuvenation, and this is not just for like a few weeks, this is like our entire life. This is why we see when people get unwell, it's typically not in our teenage years, unless we had a really severely stressed out childhood, maybe we had a lot of early and developmental birth trauma, and then if we didn't have solid, healthy practices growing up, we are seeing teenagers and such that are getting these health problems a lot younger and in their 20s, um, but typically these problems pop in our 30s and 40s because the system just can't keep up anymore. Um, and sadly, what I am seeing is more people are getting cancers and diseases a lot younger. And I think my suspicion is because we're just not resting in the way that we used to and we're not going into this low tone dorsal. So those are the, the those are not necessarily suggestions for those troubles, but that is explaining again, because I get the question a lot, how do I heal this? How do I heal this? How do I heal this? For my line of work and my scope of practice, it's we're building the foundation again. We're building that low level solidity in the system that probably never occurred when we were infants and toddlers and children. So we're doing that now. And the power of neuroplasticity is that we can do it now. It just takes some time. And if you think about how long it takes a child to learn how to fluently speak and walk and talk and have self-regulation, it takes more than a year, it takes more than two years. And this isn't to discourage anyone, it's actually to give you a lot of hope because I have worked with people that have had these troubles for decades, decades. And when we get the right practices in place and do something that I call neuroplastic healing sequencing, I talk about that in the three-part video training, Healing Trauma, when we get the sequencing on board, stuff quickens because it's exactly what the physiology wants. Here's the thing, at the end of the day, your brain, your nervous system, your relationships do not want you to be in survival mode. It might seem comfortable because that's all you've known, but the moment we start to dislodge that and get out of that, the system starts to go, holy cow, thank God. It's like it can breathe again, right? And so part of this process is understanding the importance of structuring the healing in the right way. Um, Jennifer asks, what about chronic fatigue and digestive dysfunction? I may have already answered that. Um, again, they all fall into the same boat. Um, we know that this, this chronic illness, this low level energy, this lack of flow, stagnation in the system, it isn't a disease per se, it is a root, it, the, it is a symptom, I should say, of a root problem that is nervous system dysregulation. And without a doubt, when I talk to my students and, and listen to their stories, you know, there isn't, sometimes there is, but typically there's this forward movement. You know, I, I'm, I'm visualizing some of the, shows I watch where there's like horses and people in battle and they're moving across a front, like that takes time to move an army on foot forward. It's not like today where we have fighter jets and all these things and, and cars and like, it takes time to move forward, but eventually they all get there. And so the way that our autonomic system connects to our organ systems is the same way we we start with these basics and then slowly we may not see this miraculous recovery in our gut but we start to realize that huh i'm actually feeling a little more interested in cooking my food or wow i actually just had a nap on the couch and that never happens or wow i'm really feeling this desire to go for a walk and that never occurs Right? So there's these little hints that we get when we start to do this work that show that things are advancing forward. I'll speak one more point to the chronic pain and chronic fatigue. 
And if we go back to, because I got to keep bringing this back to that root cause, but I also want to make sure that once we understand what the root cause is, i.e. chronic stress early in life, chronic um, adversity, trauma, surgical trauma, et cetera, that we know, okay, that's what it was, and then we move forward, right? There is a trouble I see sometimes where we're ruminating on the past and it's disallowing us to look forward, right? And so that's where it's really important to understand that, yep, that occurred. But one of the mechanisms by which um, we have these chronic states of stagnation and stuckness is when we had that early exposure to stress, again, usually as an infant, usually as a kid, we go into a fear response. Again, going back to the fight, flight, freeze. With a fear response is a bracing, right? Like it's a holding, it's an armoring. It's the viscera, the gut, the heart, everything going into this like protection like don't let anybody in because if i let someone in i'm going to get hurt even more that bracing comes with physiological response shortness of breath maybe there is a pain um breathing is labored but then if we don't let go of that threat because usually we can't because let's say when we're young we are living in a family system and we can't just walk away when we're three years old we can't walk away when we're five years old. Some kids try to, but usually they get found, right? So they got to come back into that sense of fear. And so that bracing turns into what is called a somatization. So the symptoms, the, the system no longer thinks I'm bracing or this is fear. It just knows it viscerally. I hope that makes sense. So that little kid doesn't think to themselves, oh, I have to go into a fear response because mom and dad are fighting again, or I have to go into a shutdown response because I hate my teacher and I just can't be here. Um, the body takes over, the somatic system takes over, and then that's where our system pops out these symptoms that end up becoming what we have classified as a chronic illness, um, an autoimmune condition, et cetera. Because we all have different pre predisposition, it pops out differently. So I just wanted to give that little example of how this chronic stress ends up becoming chronic pain, the fibromyalgia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we have had, um, experiences young that were too hard for us to take in we will not remember them because they were too hard for us to comprehend cognitively many of the people that i work with will say they have very little memories of their childhood of things they might have one memory of something good but and maybe one memory of something bad but the rest is kind of foggy and a lot of that is because when we go into this chronic stress response, this bracing, we're literally like a turtle armored inside, and that shuts down our higher brain. And then the memories of what is going on around us become muted. What occurs, I have found, is that as we start to defrost, unthaw, get out of these survival modes is the system will start to have more memory come back. It could be memories that aren't the best. It could be memories that are good. It could be memories that are purely somatic. By that, I mean, we might be laying in bed and all of a sudden our arm starts to shake and it wants to like do this crazy movement and it might make no sense. And this is where it's important to have the education to know, I'm just gonna follow that impulse and see where that goes. We may have an emotion that comes up that makes no sense, right? We may have tears come out of our eyes that have no emotion. So there's these, there's so many nuances with how the human system stores memory. We are the most complex organism on this planet, from what I know, right, in terms of higher brain and all of that. And so when we haven't been treated well and when we've been disconnected from that which makes us us, which is our body, um, we don't have the memories, but we don't need to, we do not need to remember to heal this because some of those memories are not cognitive. They're purely somatic. Hence why we want to get into this somatic experience and relearn how to be with it. 
Okay. Um, someone asks, um, I have chronic pain mainly concentrated on my shoulders, neck, and head. Um, I understand because when I've been healing through some of my old injuries, that's where it comes to. Um, when you talk of pain in your blogs, you refer more to the lower part of the body. I don't remember you talking about tension headaches. So um, I'm not familiar with me only talking about the lower part. I tend to talk more general, but maybe that's because my old injuries were to the knee um, and lower body. But it, chronic pain can pop up anywhere, and it doesn't necessarily mean that if you get this pain in your shoulder that you had an injury to the shoulder. It might be, but it might not be. Um, in terms of tension headaches, um, again, this is a response to lack of flow within the structures of the system. Um, there is a... a, a way of talking about this in our work, and I teach this in my program, S Smart Body, Smart Mind, we call them the diaphragms. And of course, we have our physical diaphragm here, which is what helps moves so that the lungs can expand and, contra and contract. In osteopathic medicine, which is where um, Peter Levine and Kathy Kane, again, my teachers, they pulled this practice from osteopathic medicine and craniosacral, they look at these diaphragms at various levels, the feet, the pelvis, um, the heart, the throat, the third eye here, and then like the crown of the head. And if you know anything about um, Eastern uh, practices, that's sort of the chakra system. And so when we have had a threat, a stress, a trauma, one of those, if not multiple parts of those centers, we also call them containers, they contract, they shut down, and they also can hold emotion and sensation. So one of the things we've seen with things like headache is that it is a lack of flow, especially in these higher containers, these higher diaphragms, and then the tension, the sensation is getting trapped. Peter Levine often will say, um, pain is trapped sensation. So tension, bracing, is something in the system that is trying to trap experience, feeling, emotion. And again, this comes back to the culture of humanity, which is we have taught people to, you know, um, I mentioned biological impulses, hold in gas, hold in the burps, hold in the sneezing, or when we sneeze, we you know, that is so painful on the system when we stop those natural things. So when it comes to headaches and tension in the body, it's being held because of that past history or the past trauma that's still kind of um, cycling through the system and causing this chaos. If we think about muscle tension, you know, if you ever have a chance, and I had the chance growing up because my parents were both veterinarians, so I was, I would would work with them when an animal was under surgery, and then when we're bringing them from the surgical table back to the kennel, you carry them, and they're just limp, like <laughs> there's no muscular tension, right? And we know from humans, too, they'll have this chronic tension in the waking state, but then when you are under anesthesia, the system is completely limp, the tension is gone, and it's because we are in that state of, in some ways, unconsciousness where we're disconnected from all of the history and all of the tensions that we carry within ourselves. So part of the work when we have these chronic tensions is learning to be more in the here and now, being in the present state, and then working at kind of, um, I have this image of like this ball with all this thing stuck to it, right? And if you've ever gone into your traps and your neck, it feels like there's this ball with things stuck to it. And we have to start teasing away these pieces that are stuck together. Um, and that is where, you know, things like body work can help. But if that muscle is staying tight because of an underlying old trauma response that's still trying to be completed, well, you can get all the mus the massage and the stretching in the world, and it will not help that relieve. So again, it comes back to how can you listen, how can you be with the system, and 
feel into it so that these old, old responses can come up and out. Someone asked a question about tinnitus or tinnitus, asking if it's a trauma response, um, how can an individual deal with it? SC seems to not work. So this is interesting because again, in my studies, tinnitus is within this clump of syndromes. Now, um, if you had actual hearing damage, like you were exposed to loud sound, loud music, I've met a lot of um, people, uh, my ex-husband fell into this trap, um, loud welding when a kid, and then lots of um, clubbing in the UK, you know, with no ear um, plugs. So he had ringing in his ear because the, there was actual damage to the ear drum itself, to those mechanisms. So that's something different. Tinnitus or tinnitus that is more spontaneous it funnels back to that thing I was talking about with the diaphragms. It's as if something is getting trapped. There is a lack of flow moving through. And so this again comes back to this person saying SC doesn't seem to work. We have to look at somatic experiencing not as one, like we go to a session, we do a session, and then we hope that it changes, like taking a course of antibiotics. We need to look at the full picture. So again, if, if the SE person you're working with does not have training at working with the somatic level, I know that might sound weird because it's called somatic experiencing, but there is a situation in our community right now where a lot of therapists and counselors who are more cognitive based are getting SE trained, but they're treating the SE training as if it's another thing that you just apply and get someone to do an exercise and then hope it changes something. That's not how SE is supposed to work. And um, it's unfortunate because the, po the power of the work comes when the practitioner is very attuned to themselves and they're attuned to the person and there needs to be, from my experience, an understanding of early trauma and working at the level of these diaphragms and working at restoring regulation and safety back to the nervous system, which I want to talk about um, in the next few minutes before we end. Um, so I have worked with people who have shifted this, this kind of ringing, um, and there are so many reasons for it. Um, but it's not necessarily because there was damage to the ear. It's as if there's a symptom in the body and it's coming out for whatever reason through that area. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, there was a question um, related to, I've never heard of this, and then I looked it up. Um, the person writes, I'm very interested in the connection to stiff person syndrome and, and trauma. I had never heard of this, stiff person syndrome and trauma. Um, so I looked it up. Of course, you can look it up and Google it. Basically, what I read when I saw that was dysregulation. It was tension, tightness, um, muscles that are stiff, immobile, painful. Um, th this is all very much... Um, these are all symptoms of the system being in dysregulation. So it comes back to what is this, the history? What did the organism have to do to stay state, to stay safe and alive? Um, it really funnels back to that. I had a thing here that I wanted to read. Let's see if I can find it. Um, yes, I'll read this in a second. A great book um, is this. You see that? It is called Trauma Spectrum, The Hidden Wounds and Human Resiliency. It's written by um, Robert Scare, forward by Peter Levine. He's of the same generation and era of Peter. He's a medical doctor. And um, this book is probably the best book I've ever read on chronic illness and um, how it pops up in relationship to trauma. But he writes here, I'm going to read this. I could just read you this whole book and it would give you a lot of information, much of what which we've already talked about. But he says, this is page 217, um, the primary symptoms of fibromyalgia are diffuse skeletal pain, so skeletal pain, 
widespread points of tenderness over the surface of the body, morning stiffness, daytime fatigue, and, and, in, and interrupted non-restorative sleep. So I've already talked about all of that. Common symptoms also include scattered area of numb, numbness and tingling, hypervigilance, so that's that orienting response that's looking for threat, and emotional instability, cognitive impairment, and dizziness. So again, this is everything that we've been talking about, this lack of emotions being able to come out cleanly, not being able to think clearly. Um, dizziness is very much related to that inner ear and not being able to orient properly. Um, he says, other common conditions linked to fibromyalgia include a strange spider web molting of the skin called levito reticularis. Someone had a question about skin changing and it becoming odd and bumpy and weird in circulation. If you look up levito reticularis, you'll see pictures of the skin actually having, it looks like an autoimmune response, but what's happening is the circulation. Again, think about that flow. It's like, it's like the skin is like the gut that has IBS. It's the skin needs flow, right? You've got all these capillaries. It needs to be in good flow. But if that autonomic dysregulation is just like chaos, right? Like the symphony that's practicing, that underneath of the skin is going to get messy, right? And so we have all these things that we've called to explain these symptoms of autonomic dysregulation. He goes on to say Raynaud's phenomena, so that's cold sensitivity. It often happens in the fingers. Um, Sicca phenomena, which is dry mouth and eyes, again, that comes back to that autonomic nervous system being able to regulate salivary production, moisture in the eyes. Um, irritable bowel, um, gastro reflux, I mean, that's basically heartburn. In interstitial cystitis, um, pain and inflammation of the bladder. So again, cystitis is a common cause of dysregulation of the nervous system. That's where there's this pressure and pain in the bladder and urine comes out frequently and not very much. People often think that that is a urinary infection. Of course, you've got to get that checked out. But if it isn't, it is often a result of this dysregulation. Multiple chemical sensitivities. I have a vlog on that on the highly sensitive person and what multiple chemical sensitivities are. Typically, when someone has chronic illness, that's packed in there too. Um, I won't get into that because I know we're getting pretty long in this call, but watch that vlog if you haven't already. And mitral valve prolapse and dysautonomia syn syn syndrome. So again, mitral valve, that has to do with the heart, not knowing how to properly pump. I apologize, there was a question in here about skin and about um, premature ventricular contractions, PVCs, and that connected to hypervigilance. I hope you're seeing this is all the same thing. It's just being, it's being represented differently in each of us because we're each different in our genetics. We come from different heritages and lineages and, and um, countries and the way that we were brought up, all of this will determine the way in which we express stress in a syndromal state. So um, that is a great, this is a great book. It's got, it's more about diagnosis. There really isn't um, treatment. If you read a lot of these books, they're all about diagnosis because we're in that stage right now in history where we're trying to figure out what the heck this stuff is. And from what I've seen, again, with my learnings with Peter Levine, reading things like this, working with Kathy Kane, and then working with my students, some pretty miraculous stuff happens that defies medical, current medical science when we work at regulating the nervous system. Um, I have not gotten to every single question here, but I hope this has given you, in the 90 minutes, a little bit of information to understand what chronic illness is, how it presents in the system, the myriad of ways in which it presents. I mean, typically one person just doesn't have one thing. When we've had this kind of early trauma that has not been treated, it represents 
in not just chronic illness, but often um, anxieties, depressions, fear, OCD, not trusting people, not trusting ourselves, um, being stuck, being mobile, not just in body, but in thought. So I hope this has given everyone a little bit of info on this. As I've said, um, I'm just scrolling through here. As I've said, the only way forward with this is to do the work. We can read and read and, and, and listen, but we have to actually learn the language of our nervous system. If we didn't get it taught to us when we were young, just like if we weren't taught multiple languages when we're young, we have to treat this as if we are learning a second language as adults. Um, and the best way to do that from what I've seen, and of course I'm biased, is to get into the work that myself and my colleagues are experts at. As I said, there is a three-part healing trauma training going on right now. While this is available all year round, we're in a heightened part of the year because we're leading up to Smart Body, Smart Mind, which is my online program. It's a group program. It is a paid program, and it is like going to Nervous System University. You're learning the deeper education, because there's more to it than what we've talked about today. It gets into the practices in a very sequ sequential, titrated, slow-paced fashion. While it is 12 weeks, it is not over in 12 weeks. That is just the beginning. Many of my students take years to go through the 12 weeks, and that's exactly what we want, because you could not learn a foreign language fluently in 12 weeks. I know some people say they can, but I don't think that's possible based on what I've seen in my own learnings. We have to know how to spin that language in different situations. A lot of folks will do programs and learnings and they'll be really good in a very controlled environment and then they go out into the real world and everything falls apart and we don't want that. We want to be robust so we can go out and enjoy what is out there. Um, so, like I said, healing trauma video series, get into that watch it, learn, come into our other Facebook group, Healthy Nervous System Revo Revolution. My team is in there answering questions right now. Thank you for all of your questions. I know I didn't get to everything, um, but be proud that you are here. Know that you're doing really important work. Every drop of work we do in this realm moves the needle forward for our entire universe and planet here. That is my belief. I hope you believe that too. Share this with people who might need to know this information. Um, like I said, to go back to the very beginning, all the things are lining up, science, research, and practice. We just gotta move forward together.